We're here today with Chris Boucher from the Imperial Valley in California. He is the first to grow industrial hemp in the United States in 1994. And um, that was by permission from the local USDA research station as well as the local agricultural commission uh, at the state level. So thank you very much for joining us here today. It's really a pleasure to have you uh, in the state of Colorado. Well, I'm honored to be here in Rocky Mountains. <laughs> it's a good place. So today, it's kind of funny, um, I actually ran into, literally, uh, Chris Boucher at the Amendment 64 board meeting, the governor's board meeting. And um, as a lot of you out there that understand the history of hemp uh, are aware, he's one of the, the prominent figures that has probably the most knowledge about what industrial hemp can offer us at a farming level, at an economic level, and community and social uh, environmental levels as well. And so, Chris, I wanted to ask you um, a little bit more about the background, uh, just to give us uh, some context in, in uh, Imperial Valley, uh, and what it took to actually grow those plants and what stopped you. So, if you could just give us a little context um, as to how you actually got that first seed in the ground, and then take it from there. That's always a good question. <laughs> Um, actually, you know, we started as a, you know, global issue, national issue, and the bottom line, we, we knew that if we were going to grow this crop, since we had Hempstead Company making hats, wallets, bags, hemp seed oil, hemp seed, all imported from China. You know, our main motto was Made in America. If you see our old advertisement, right. it says Hempstead, Made in USA. It was before the anti-China movement, and uh, but we, we were... Definitely, that was our motive, but uh, we realized that we had to start locally. And we went in, we picked out a farming community that had ties to hemp 60, 70 years ago. And uh, we were able to, you know, identify uh, uh, an area to grow this crop. And we have interviewed quite a few people, farmers, and uh, we were asked to do a presentation with the uh, local USDA research station on our crop. And uh, the president of, the, of Dick Kershaw, who was the president of the USDA research station at the time, actually for the last 22 years, and he asked the board of directors to review it, and they thought it would uh, enhance the local economy. Fantastic. Um, we said, hey, if we grow this crop, um, it wasn't, a, you know, one issue was the fiber, the food, um, the textiles, um, but one of our main components was we were going to generate some jobs in Imperial Valley, California. The unemployment rate at the time was about 28%. I think last week it was probably like um, 27 or 20, 27.5% unemployment. And that's the average in California in most farming communities. So we were able to use that in our sort of, of like a uh, social investment, you know, to um, create jobs in a very depressed community. And uh, agriculture happens to have the hardest hit uh, unemployment uh, in the United States of America, but in any state. And you find the highest unemployment rate is in the agricultural communities. This is essentially what we're facing yeah. here in Colorado. So what I'm trying to say is that that was like, I think, the emotional issue that made the whole community say, we're going to grow this crop. Our grandparents grew it. Because granted, this was Imperial Valley where the Schlichten decorticator was invented. And we're all familiar with the Schlichten decorticator. It was uh, when uh, the first machine that was invented in the 20s could decorticate hemp into fiber and scripts and what all the newspapers wanted to. So what's old newspapers? We won't go there. Let's stay focused. So what's and, interesting uh, though is, is um, you're bringing to the table exactly what uh, our strategy is here in Colorado with HB 1099, the fighter remediation bill that we passed last year. Um, we feel that this is a jobs issue. That this is something that the farming community needs. And also, from my perspective, I need to respect them as farmers because I believe that they really are the heart of America. They, they keep us alive with, with the food, the soil, and so on and so forth. Um, honestly, I have to say thank you to you. Um, what I modeled 
our progress off of was what you had done in the past. Um, it was well, I am honored that you guys did it, man. Connecting. High five, you guys <laughs> did it. It's connecting with those yeah. with those people. They're, they're just like us. So, yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank it's one of the first bills, I think, uh, that was passed through uh, legislation yes. for actual yes. um, uh, grow status. Yes, and so we actually have a current project. We are growing um, in, in the state of Colorado, uh, some hemp plants, and we are moving forward with the federal mediation study. But uh, my question for you, um, in addition to HB 1099, since then, this last, uh, last year in November, we passed Amendment 64. And so I find it interesting that to run into you at the uh, governor's board meeting about Amendment 64, but what brought you here to Colorado? Um, what interested you in, specifically in relation to uh, HB 1099 and also um, currently what we're trying to do with industrial hemp? hemp? Well, we, we saw it as a major victory for the whole hemp movement, cannabis, sativa, hemp, which was classified. Um, and comparative to all the other hemp bills, I'm thinking there's 14 or 15 states that have industrial hemp legislation. And uh, the Amendment 64 wasn't just legislation, it was uh, dictating the state constitution. So we saw that as a real logical and professional way for a state to implement these laws. You know, and the public has been involved in it, and uh, we thought it would be uh, a good idea to approach the state, or uh, actually the farmers, and develop some hemp seed processing mills in some communities. And so this is the big question. Uh, a lot of people see that they see the value, and they're excited about Amendment 64, and the hemp, and everyone talks about hemp, but for the people that we're talking to, um, in terms of the general population that doesn't know what hemp is. I think what I'd like to ask you is, can you take us into uh, what the real economy may look like? How is this gonna help out in terms of numbers? How many jobs could actually be produced? What kind of economic potential can be brought to the state in terms of taxes or environmental repair or export products? Um, I, I want to take this beyond that burlap sack idea, if you will, of hemp because this actually goes into the aerospace industry, into food products, and, and so on and so forth. So if you could talk about the actual concrete numbers that we want to be brought towards, or examples of. Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, currently, well, so we'll say 2012, it's estimated at about uh, a half a billion dollars in industrial hemp sales, and that's all inclusive of shampoos, the clothing, the Now that's just in the, the United seed States. Oil. That's just in the United States, and that's without Whole Foods and their body shop reporting on the revenue. Um, it's called the SPINS data study, and it was uh, done by professional uh, retail uh, uh, products industry uh, um, consulting firm. Anyways, they're very well known. It's called the SPINS data studies, and they do them in everything. Look that and up, look up the spin studies. Yeah, spin studies. studies, and you can see what each category um, from every product, and uh, it was a great uh, putting the finger on the pulse of the industry. So we're talking a half a billion dollars in 2012, and that is all 100% imported mm -hmm. industrial hemp products. And it sounds like that's really still a, a niche market. So that's not well, including, uh, say, the that's not Well, that's, that figure is not including Whole Foods. What we could say is probably another 100 million or maybe 50 million will be conservative. So um, if we could maybe get 10% of that revenue the first year, bring it into Colorado, and be able to enter the market, I, I think that uh, would be Quite substantial to the economy. Too. Real, yeah. Well, we'll say ten percent of a half a billion. How, how much is that? That's fifty million dollars that we could pour back into the state um, uh, with the local farm economy. Fantastic. And, and, yes. That really that, that puts things in in perspective uh, in concrete. Terms. We would have to have a lot of investment into infrastructure. You know, we just can't grow it and expect like buyers will come. I mean, there is a market already built here in the United States. It's just being able to take it from raw seed or raw fiber and turning it into a uh, 
So oil pricing problem. is relatively simple in terms of, of uh, infrastructure. That's something that um, probably exists in the state of Colorado already. Yeah, you'd operate as a food uh, service facility, food agri. And then I also understand in, in gypsum, uh, there may be a plant that's already been tooled to produce uh, OSB uh, fiberboard. And so it, it's interesting to see that we actually may be able to take current in infrastructure in the state of Colorado and start to gear it towards um, using the hemp economy and actually sell product right out of the field. Because that's the big yeah. concern to the farmer. They want to know, hey, I need to know, can I sell this product? Uh, yes. Not, not yes. after I build this stuff. Exactly, and the building materials, uh, building materials are all sequestered carbon. So, so in, in, in essence, example. you're not just buying a product; you're buying sequestered carbon. We're talking 2,500 pounds of sequestered carbon per acre. Okay, um, how can I compare that to another crop? Uh, cotton is negative 800 pounds of carbon. So. Our future is all going to be sequestering carbon, and that, that kind of uh, ecological approach, I think, is going to make it really sustainable. And we just have to re-educate uh, the consumers of what's more important. You know, a product that uh, you know consumes 15 kilograms of carbon just to wear that shirt or wear that hat or eat that food. And as a planet, we're going to have to be conscious about that in the future. You bring up the cotton aspect of this, and obviously. Um, cotton nowadays has a bad connotation to it. Cotton emits 800 pounds per acre of carbon. And I, so I it's actually, you're already starting with a negative carbon product before you even get it. And from what I understand, this shirt, for example, used approximately 9,000 liters of water to produce a cotton shirt, whereas it only would be 300 liters for a hemp shirt. Um, a short sleeve men's t shirt consumes about. Uh, about 300 gallons of water, maybe 500, depending on if it was organic or com commercial. So my math's a little off, but yeah. <laughs> There's a couple different figures out there, you know, depending if you did irrigated cotton or it's you did... It's so considerably more in terms of the water consumption. Water yeah, a hemp t-shirt would probably water. consume, well, a hemp t-shirt's 55%, 45% cotton. Um, so it still consumes water, but uh, that 55% hemp, has a sequestered carbon uh, quality to it that is just, you know, there's no other plant that can sequester carbon like this, you know. I mean, the, that, that uh, hemp experiment house they built in Asheville uh, has been referenced to sequester 22,000 pounds, I think it is, of CO2 in its lifetime, or its, its expected lifetime. So these numbers are fascinating. They're really, they're tremendous. They're not only positive numbers, but they're big positive numbers. Like you had pointed out, cotton has a negative impact. Um, yeah, and, and, so, and after you grow cotton, every single farmer to this day that you cannot grow on that field that you grew that cotton on for two years, they just have, what they so do is they do. environmentally detrimental. Well, I've worked with a lot of different farmers, a lot of cotton farmers all want to grow hemp. And so they rotate their acreage in three. Every three years, they move all their crops. And they have this whole rotator system. And they leave the other two seasons fallow, essentially, just empty crops or no crops. Yeah, they'll do some uh, green till, okay. you know, or they might chemically fertilize Clover it, depending. But but now with the BT cotton, that is a new white gold, you know, in um, California, Arizona. But now that water's gone up, right? Um, we were paying. Ten bucks an acre foot. It went up to twenty. I think here in Colorado, you guys are paying. San Luis Valley, uh, DOS. You could probably correct me on um, on the acre foot, the cost per water in it's, it's San there. Yeah. Juan Valley. I, I don't have that. Seventy-five dollars to a hundred dollars, I believe. Now, when you're in a metropolitan city like here in Golden. If you're a homeowner, you're probably paying a thousand dollars an acre foot, or maybe twelve hundred. Okay, so so the, the farmer, yeah, yeah. So you couldn't grow industrial hemp in a um, urban residential urban area. urban area because of the cost of water. Gotcha. gotcha. And then once the cost of water gets above a hundred dollars, and that's one thing that happened with the cotton industry, um, it got hammered because the cost of water went up in Arizona, so, California. And they said, well. I, I, 
have enough money to um, pay for the water. So what you're presenting here, though, is that this is this crop affects so many different areas economically, obviously in terms of its environmental impacts and value-added product potential, but in terms of its positive economic potential, just by putting that plant to the ground, we're looking at something that has impacts that are not just one layer deep, but they're multiple layers deep. And so it's the water consumption, it's the pest lack of or using less pesticides, herbicides, it's bringing in a more rotation crops instead of just putting a green field. For yeah, example. it's a real good eco-friendly yeah. business plan model. And that's, you know, definitely, I think in any business now, it's not how great your product is, but what's your footprint, what's your, your, your green, you know, green the ecological company. footprint. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, and, I, and I think that's... It reminds uh, me of my uh, urban planning and, <laughs> and environmental yes. design days. Chris, I know there's a lot more to talk about, but um, we really need to kind of keep this short. So I just want to say thank you again for being here. It's really Dude, a pleasure. Thank you. 1099, man. <laughs> thank keep you for that, that as well. rolling, man. Glad to see you. And just to there. throw this at you, um, and this is why I'm excited to have you up here. And for the people out there, we are just about to introduce a industrial hemp bill for Colorado. So keep that in the back of your head and think about what uh, we can talk about next time we have you on. All right. So thanks again. Right. Thanks for listening, and we'll have more for you later. I'll have more for you later.